Dear friends, let us continue to love one another for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Amen? Amen. All right. Let's pray. Father, I praise you, um, obviously, for humility with this entire congregation already this morning. Uh, Father, I ask, uh, I ask that, Father, you continue to make your presence known here. Father, we invite you in here every single time the doors are open, and even when it's not open. Father, we want you to consume this property. Father, I'm just asking that everyone in this room today will feel your presence and understand that this word is coming directly from you. This week has been a, a week full of joy, but also, Father, a week full of um, some distraction, some pride. Father, I just ask that the joy that you've given me this week is what takes over today, and that you block everything else out. Father, in this moment, I'm asking that you anoint me from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. This message that you've given me today, uh, Father, I, I'm going to need it. I de- I'm, I'm going to need you in a major way. But Father, all those distractions, anything that's trying to block me from giving your word today, Father, I ask that you throw that into the sea. Father, just replace it with you, and most importantly, Father, your love to pour out on your people today. I ask these things in your name. Help us to love, laugh, and forgive. Amen. All right, so um, if you notice, there wasn't a slide up there for the first verse that that we read. Uh, That's not Nick's fault. Don't be mad at him. So yesterday, uh, I spent 10 to 11 hours putting a sermon together (laughs) because somebody sent me an email on a verse, and uh, it really made me start questioning it, so I spent a lot of time studying on this verse. So 10, 11 hours studying on it, and, and then all of a sudden, everything's fine, this is what I'm preaching on, and then on the way here today, he says, no, that's not what I need you to talk about today. So that just means I get to rest one, one, one week, I don't have to put a sermon together. But what he told me today on the way here is he had a message that needed to go directly to this congregation and our online congregation, and this pastor that stands before you. I want to go look at John 13, 34. No, it's John 13, 34. You know what it says on on my notes? It's the yellow mark. That's what it shows me. I might be dyslexic, I ain't colorblind, okay? Before we, while y'all are getting there, you guys, if you consider yourself a Christian, you should consider yourself a disciple. You know what the number one job of a disciple is? Number one job. Love people. It's your number one job. If you consider yourself a disciple, you're called to love everyone. Everyone. Even your enemies. John 13, 34. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. If you're not loving people, you don't need to call yourself a disciple. You know, (laughs) there's a lot of Christians out there, guys. They can put on that church face. 
They can show up on Sunday morning. They can shake hands and kiss babies. And, you know, oh, I'll pray for you, you know. But are you really loving people? Are you really putting your heart out there for people? Even your enemies. Even your enemies. Matthew 5, 43 through 48. Y'all got to be patient with me. I apologize. Well, actually, I'm not going to apologize. I'm doing exactly what he told me to do. Matthew 5, 43 through 48. You have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. This is Jesus speaking, by the way. Y'all didn't know that. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both evil and the good. And he sends rain on the just and the unjust. If you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors. We got any tax collectors in here? I'm praying for you. Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. But you are the perfect, or excuse me, you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. There's something here that I want y'all to catch, and it says, but I say love your enemies, and then it says, pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true, true children of your Father in heaven. How many of y'all have someone that, that you just, man, it's it, it hard to love them? It's hard to love them. I, I, listen, one more time. Show of hands. Who's got somebody that's hard to love? Somebody you know, okay? Yeah, both hands. Show of hands who's sitting next to you. Is it one sitting next to you right now? Guys, what the Word is telling us right here is those people that, that, that He wants you to love on, these enemies that you have, sometimes they're not going to accept that. So what's it telling you to do? You pray for them. Prayer is love. When you've got somebody that won't give you the time of day, when you've got somebody that it's so hard to just even love on, when you, let's say you got somebody that brings out the worst in you, so you know good and well you don't need to be around them because then you ain't going to act like a Christian. Now, show of hands, who's got somebody like that? Yeah, amen? Guys, pray for them. Your father's telling you, he gets it, he knows our flesh. He knows when we struggle with people. He knows when we can't, we just cannot physically, emotionally love people. So he asks you to go to prayer and spiritually love people. Your flesh sucks. Your flesh ain't going to do it. Your flesh ain't no good. But your spirit's perfect. So when you got someone like that, you pray for them. Do y'all realize that the greatest weapon that's bestowed upon us as a Christian, is love. It's love. That's the greatest weapon. And you're like, weapon? Really? Like all those spiritual, all the spiritual warfare and all that kind of stuff. Love is the greatest weapon that God has bestowed upon us. Love can change people's hearts, minds, and futures. Love can do that. L listen, y'all don't have to keep up with me, but I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Okay? I got to get through this. We got baptism. Three things will last forever. Faith, 
hope and love, and the greatest is love. Greatest weapon he's given us. If you're struggling with somebody, <laughs> it's going to be hard. If you're struggling with somebody, what, what the word is telling us, Jesus said it, this is telling us that love is the greatest of all. So what it's telling you is when somebody, when you're struggling with somebody, and you know those, those people, when you see them, you cringe, or you see them, you just want to punch them in the mouth, but you ain't going to do that because that ain't what Christians do, okay? Amen? Especially Christian warriors, we don't do that. You, you, you attack with love. You attack with love. What's that old saying, you know, uh, honey catches more bees than, what is it? T tell me that one. What is that? What she said. Yeah, that right there. Guys, that's not a proverb, but I think it might should be. You attack them with love. I want you to think about it. Let's say you got beef with somebody, and it's been going on for years. Years, and shame on y'all if it's gone on that long, okay? Because it's two-sided, by the way. It ain't just that person. Don't be trying to blame it on that person. Your pride's there, too, if you've let it go on that long. So here's what I need you to grasp. If you got somebody, you got beef with them, and, 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 and this is going on for years, and you see them at Walmart. I don't go to Walmart. You see them at Albertsons, okay? I love Walmart, but, but Albertsons is quicker. So I'm walking down the aisle, and I see this dude that I never liked, we had a major issue, had this big falling out, whatever, and I see him in the aisle at Albertson. And let's say this guy walks straight up to me, looks me right in the eye, and asks for my forgiveness. It takes love to forgive someone. Now, if that's you, and that person does that to you, aren't you going to fold <laughs> Aren't you going to say, hey, man, no problem? I'll tell you this. If you're sitting here thinking right now, no, I wouldn't, you got a problem. You got a problem. Jesus said himself, if you don't love people, you're not a disciple. Grace and mercy, guys, that's a major sign of love. Quit holding those grudges. Guys, even if you're the one that's right. Even if you're the one that's right. Because here's the thing. It's not about you winning the battle. It's about God winning the battle. Amen? Amen. Guys, we must honor each other as well. That's one major way that we can show love. I'm going to go to Romans 12, 9 through 10. Don't just pretend to love others. Oh, don't pretend to love others. Don't put on your church face and your church hug and your church handshake and all that junk. In other words, don't be a fake Christian. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection. Not fake church face affection. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Delight in that. Man, how hard is that right now? Some of y'all are thinking about somebody right now you're so mad at and you're like, I got to take delight in honoring this person? Now listen, that doesn't mean you got to, you know, go have lunch with them every day. You know, that doesn't mean you got to go, you know, play bunko with them all the time. Honor, how you give honor to someone is just being respectful and, and, and praying for them. You know, There's not many churches that just preach on God's love. There's so many churches that get so caught up in trying to give you all this meat instead of the simplest thing that he gives us. 
It's just to love on people. And I'm going to tell y'all right now, shame on me. Loving on people, loving on this congregation, loving on the outside of these four walls has not been my number one focus here lately. I don't mind standing up here and humbling myself because if it'll just humble one of you, it's a victory. I've been more concerned with putting sermons together, trying to find that meat for you guys. Listening to too much criticism. When the only thing I need to concentrate on is loving y'all and teaching you how to love. I apologize to this congregation. It's, uh, you know, the buck stops with me. And, you know, that's what he was showing me is in the last month, I've been counseling some different people and one of the biggest things I see is they just, they just can't love somebody. And he told me this morning, gave you that flock. You're supposed to be teaching them. And you've lost track. Our focus should always be, and it should never get away from, loving people. God is love. Uh, he made me, okay, some of this stuff, guys, it may not be in order, okay? Again, I'm just being obedient. He told me this, tell the congregation, love on their family. Now, I know, I know, I know you're like, How here we go, he's going to start preaching on husbands and wives again. No, I'm not. Love on your family, and here, here's why I need you to, 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 I need you to grasp this. If you got children, especially you younger ones, you, you, you younger people that either got little ones right now that, you know, you, you about want to kill, or I know we've got some that are expecting, you only got them 18 years. And see, the more you love them, the more you're instilling God in them. You young couples, I'm telling you, take it from somebody that's not a whole lot older than you. You're going to blink, and your kids are going to college. Even worse than that, they're driving cars, you know? Love on your spouse. Guys, what's that old country song? Tim McGraw, live like you were dying. Love on your spouse like you're dying. You got bad news, you weren't going to be here tomorrow. I mean, I don't know about y'all. I love all y'all, but I ain't going to come talk to y'all. I'm going to spend 24 hours with my wife. Guys, we take that for granted. The love of our spouse, the love of our children. We take family for granted. Every day you wake up, you need to be thinking, how can I love my family more? And again, because keep in mind, the more you love on them, the more you're instilling God in your household. You want a peaceful household? Love on your family. Yep, I uh, say I was fixing to talk about Mikey, but I'm not now. It's right there. No, I guess I will. That man back there is the perfect reflection of someone loving people. I don't know that I've ever seen anybody love people like Mikey does. And, and Mike, I want you to know something. When I'm struggling to love on somebody, I think about you. You set a great example, brother. I thank you for that. We've all got somebody like that in our lives, guys, that we can look up to that just love people. 
to strive to be like that each and every day. Sometimes it's hard to love Mikey, but besides that, We're not truly loving. Okay, so, so grass. Okay. We struggle with loving people, right? Do you know the best way for us to, to learn to love people? Very simple. Just love God. You know, if you love God, everything else falls into place. Everything. And now I'm fixing to deliver something that he gave me to give to you and to me. So don't think that I'm just standing up here, you know, barking at y'all. Because trust me, when he told me this, I was sitting back in the study and I already spent 15 minutes back here bawling my eyes out, okay? Feeling very convicted. We're not loving God like we should. It hurts, doesn't it? We're not. You can see it in a lot of people because they're not loving others. You can see it in a lot of people because they're in a bad mood all the time. You can see it in a lot of people. It's just pure hatred. Some of y'all were here a couple weeks ago I showed two videos of my boy Scotty Scheffler. Who saw what happened to him this week? Show of hands. Okay. <laughs> First of all, okay, well, some of y'all don't know. What happened was, Scotty Scheffler is a professional golfer, for y'all that don't know. He won the Masters a few weeks back. He's my favorite golfer. He's from Dallas, Texas. Excellent guy. Fine Christian man. Fine Christian man. And last week or two weeks ago, we showed a video of him literally giving all the glory to God and also saying that it didn't matter if he won the golf term or not because being a professional golfer is not what he's known by, by Christ. And then the next video was him literally ushering his caddy ahead of him in the victory walk to the clubhouse at the Masters, which has never been done before. He is a very humble, fine Christian man. So Friday morning... He's on his way to the golf tournament, the PGA's this weekend. PGA, it's, it's a, those of you who don't know, it's a major, okay? It's a ma There's four majors. I, I can't explain all this. Oh, we'll be up here forever. Anyway, he's going to a golf tournament, and unfortunately, a, a man died that morning, got ran over by a shuttle bus who was working at the golf course. And uh, they gave, all the players have this little P sticker for player that sits in the window of their car. And what they were telling them, literally a cop said, okay, for all of y'all that are players, you can go down the median, past all the traffic, and get into to the golf tournament. So Scotty's just doing what he was told. And this cop jumps out in front of him, starts hollering, hey, what are you doing, and so forth. And he jumps on his car, trying to get him to stop. By the time he stops, the cop's a drug a little ways and so forth. Cop gets upset, grabs Scotty, throws him up against the car, handcuffs him, sends him to jail. Sends him to jail. Now, I ain't mad at that cop, because here's the thing, guys. I need you to understand, that was a chaotic moment. That's never happened before. Somebody dies right in front of a golf course where the major's at that morning. Like, really? That just, that doesn't happen. I'm sure it was a lot of chaos. What I love about Scotty Shuffler was when they asked him later on about the situation, he wasn't mad. In fact, He's paying for the medical conditions that the cop had. And it's, it's not Scotty's fault, y'all. I need you to understand, it's not his fault. Scotty could easily go against the police. He could badmouth them. He could sue them. There's a lot of things he could do. But instead, he forgave immediately. And then he actually, he, he, he showed joy. He actually has talked to the cop, all the other cops. They were laughing and cutting up. And Guys, I just I, I want to ask you a question. If that happened to you, how would you react? Not your fault. 
And you got embarrassed on live television, by the way. Millions of people saw it. Hundreds of millions of people. How would you react? Scotty acted out of love. Said a bad mouth and then say that again. Yeah. The reason I bring that story up is not even, the, the main point of the story is not even that Scotty handled it the right way, which praise God he did. Okay. The main point of it is this, guys. When you are showing the reflection of Christ, when you are loving on people, when people see God working through you, you're going to get attacked. You better attack back with the weapon of love. Amen? Amen.